We now have the great, great pleasure of both Etel and I to introduce our next speaker, um, a very old friend and fellow traveler and colleague of, uh, of Etel, the great poet uh, Robert Grenier, who um, has taught literature and writing at UC Berkeley, uh, Franconia College, and New College of California, has published many, many poetry books. Uh, the first time I come across his work was when we talked about transformation with Etel, uh, and Etel showed us the extraordinary book which uh, Simon Fatal published in 1997, All on Bow, which is basically a book all about transformation of, of, uh, of words. Uh, and that's how this idea was born, that Etel suggested that we would invite uh, Bob here uh, to read poetry. And I will now hand over to Etel, who will make a second introduction to Bob Grenier. Well, it, um, you know, it's a, it's a privilege to have a chance to talk about Bob Grenier, who is, in my sense, not only in my sense, one of the most important poets in the United States. He is um, he's a supreme intellect, and he is, in the same time, a non-intellectual Poet. He is pure poet. He is um, uh, he's more than a person who wrote books or poems. He is vital to the whole poetry scene in the United States. He is a courageous, extraordinary person who invested his whole life in looking at trees waiting for some illumination, running uh, like a squirrel in the morning. Uh, he is really a total human being a, and a total poet and a total friend, I hope. <laughs> Thank you. A very, very warm welcome to Robert Grenier. Okay, so uh, I want to thank Hans Ulrich uh, for inviting me and uh, Su Susan Friedland to come to participate uh, here and to give us an occasion to uh, come out and get um, to make a journey away from uh, northern Vermont where we live, uh, where uh, the season is in the process of transformation. Uh, Right now, uh, we were putting the garden to bed, as we say, uh, um, digging up the potatoes and, and uh, harvesting the dried beans from the bean vines, which, as it turns out, uh, dry uh, um, uh, in the pod. And then you, uh, you take them out and you make bean soup from, from the beans, which are not, not, not wasted. And, and it's good in the winter time. But the winter can be, uh, I mean, and uh, I love this. Uh, someone said that, uh, oh, Etel. And I can speak to Etel uh, because of, of hearing her uh, just now over there, back there. Uh, the winters are winter. And uh, there's no problem about transformation in the, in the, quote, natural world and in the human body. We live there. And so, uh, and uh, on the other hand, there's nothing to be done about it. Uh, it's not a problem that we can solve or something that uh, uh, one needs even to think about, uh, but to live uh, and then to fulfill whatever one's uh, condition uh, makes possible. Nonetheless, uh, I had some ideas about what I might say when I heard that we were going to come here, uh, I began thinking about what I might 
say to address the theme of the uh, topic and all that. And so I have prepared um, uh, uh, an extensive preliminary uh, uh, statement about um, the uh, circumstance and the problem of transformation. But then I realized in the 15 minutes given to me, I would not be able to present that, that uh, thorough um, sort of consideration of the whole uh, you know, um, area. And so I decided that I would uh, um, try to describe my attempt to prepare a preliminary statement of the problem of, uh, and, and uh, responsibilities, et cetera, of transformation in this terrible circumstance where the world is, is destroying itself uh, uh, in our lifetimes. It's just extraordinary. And uh, uh, so, but then I realized I wouldn't have time to prepare my, my account of my attempt to prepare the preliminary statement either in the 15 minutes that was given to me. And so obviously the circumstance is impossible. Uh, nonetheless, um, that too was a transfer. Oh, for God's sake, everything. Uh, do I have to talk about transformation all the time? Um, anyway, but uh, since I, I'm a, a writer, a, a poet, I thought that uh, I could give you uh, at least a, a kind of account of, of, well, how these changes have happened to me, uh, commonly called my development, uh, as a retrospect of all that. So in order to get to this, that stuff over there, uh, which I will speak to if I have time, oh. Uh, there was a problem growing up for me uh, in the 1950s, a common cultural problem, and, and this will be all too familiar to most of you. We were alienated from uh, ourselves and from the world. It was a subject-object problem. It was uh, that somehow we were not part of the world in which we were a part of, and we had to transform that in some way and get beyond it. Uh, and uh, reading uh, 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 Husserl's uh, Cartesian Meditations was a beginning for me uh, to try to narrow down the condition in which uh, the world is actually experienced so that you brought only your uh, cognitive, perceptual, affective capacities to the engagement with what showed itself. And you didn't uh, remember anything, and that's easy for me now because I don't remember very much. Uh, easier for me now. So uh, then you could actually have um, a, an intentional object, so-called, that you uh, were in some immediate relation to. And that might be one of the ways of solving this problem, which doesn't exist for anybody anymore, I hope. Of, of, uh, of, of being where you are in the immediate moment. And then there was all that stuff about be here now, which I, I was you know, not too bad an idea, but how to accomplish that uh, was a big problem then and still continues to be. So um, um, I want to uh, read certain things uh, that might relate to that. So in, uh, uh, I've apprenticed myself in my, in my work as a poet to B Robert Creeley initially and then the Larry Eigner uh, after that. Uh, and um, Creeley's book, uh, Pieces, was very important to me, uh, published in 69. And it, can, it started with a kind of invocation. I tried to think of the word for that in what you put in the beginning of a book. But in this case, uh, the invocation was uh, from Allen Ginsberg. Um, yes, yes, that's what I wanted. I always wanted to return to the body where I was born. Uh, and so, oh, this presentation is going to devolve, I hope, sooner than later. How much it's time to quit? I, I uh, Nefeli Scarmia was my, you know, quote, contact person at the certain time. And um, I suggested to Nefeli that she uh, institute some kind of uh, hook 
like they used to have in the uh, days of uh, um, um, uh, when people went on stage uh, in, in New York. Uh, what was that called? Huh? Vaudeville. Vaudeville. They, they took them off stage uh, when their time was up, when they were too boring or they had gone on too long. And the fellow, he sent me a nice cartoon. I don't remember what, Bugs Bunny or somebody like that, who, who was being pompous and absurd. And so uh, the culmination and, and uh, sort of uh, resolution of the um, mind-body problem is, rep was represented for me uh, uh, quite uh, well. Uh, in a recent issue of the St. Mark's news newsletter, the St. Mark's Poetry Project in New York. And it's a uh, full page spread of, of, of Allen Ginsberg naked. <laughs> and uh, it's not very sexy, <laughs> but it satisfies something for me. <laughs> Allen Ginsberg, 1985, <laughs> uh, and it says, uh, Odalesk, my uh, bedroom. Uh, young naked friend took my picture, 437 East 12th Street, New York, March 22, 1985, Allen Ginsberg. So this solves the mind-body problem for me. On the other hand, uh, I thought to myself, a little bird told me that there still was the problem of, of the um, individual's perception of the self as it occurs in the ongoing language process that we are also born into in addition to the body. But there is a body of language that we are also living inside that one might wish to uh, uh, my desire to have a closer relation to. Um, some of that uh, produced uh, the, uh, what's it called, the interior narrative in Joyce's Ulysses, for example. The, what's that called? The monologue, the, no, the, huh? Oh yeah, so, um, and I really, you know, uh, I mean, I could, you know, expose my, I mean, I could, I'm naked now, I'm, I'm standing here, but it doesn't solve the problem of the relationship between language and, and uh, one's own experience, one's own interior monologue, oh, that's the word for it, and uh, also the world elsewise. So, in a way, there's only silence um, after one becomes naked and presents that self to the world as oneself. Still, uh, there was another problem uh, which I found articulated in the, uh, in William Carlos Williams' uh, 1923 Spring and All, and then later uh, in a letter that he wrote to uh, the fiction writer Kay Boyle, which was published in Contact, uh, which is in Williams' uh, selected letters. Uh, uh, Williams writes to Kay Boyle, there is no workable poetic form extant today. And that's uh, for persons who think that somehow a reimagination, transformation of language might be able to bring them closer to their own interior uh, thought process and to their perception of what's happening in the world elsewise. And so, this is a mission that Williams embarked upon, and that impressed me when I was a kid in college. Uh, and so, uh, and uh, an, it was called Finding the Measure, Finding the Measure. And whatever Williams means by the measure uh, would be up to whatever anybody was able to invent and discover that might be a form that the language might be activated to do, which would uh, uh, create the world in the reinvigorated uh, form that the imagination, this is William's term again in spring and all, would, uh, uh, would present that would allow something that existed to 
come forth and show itself as what it is. Uh, so uh, this project has been one that I've been on now for a long time, and uh, so uh, I'd like to state it as a project so that my own, you know, experiments are not simply, uh, are not a demonstration of a solution to the question of how this can be accomplished. It's an open question, I think, today, too, for persons who are working with words to think of other ways in which the language can be organized and, uh, and uh, developed to, to, uh, to accomplish. It's a little like the mind-body problem, but, but it's like the, uh, the way the world can show itself in, 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 in words. And so I want to give you a little account of my, quote, development and the things that were interesting to me just because it's my own development, and this is the, not the only way to, quote, do this. So anyway, I better put on my glasses so I can read. It might be the case that, that simply to be naked in the world would be enough, would be adequate. I, I'm fully prepared to encompass that possibility. And as one gets older, Ezra Pound, for example, language stopped. And I presume he was there. He must have been there. He might not have been naked. So it's another way of, oh, as we were organizing to come, we were watching a program on the on American Public Broadcasting, PBS. Uh, which was a, uh, you could look at it. Um, huh. It was a three-part presentation called The Mystery of Matter, Search for the Elements. Uh, and it uh, chronicled, among other things, uh, the activities of Joseph Priestley and Humphrey Davies at the Royal Institution in London in the beginning of the 19th century. So I thought, well, that's interesting. Going to London now, we find this. and. Uh, Humphrey Davies, in particular, uh, came from uh, Cornwall, came from, where did he come from? Penzance. And um, he prepared and studied, uh, uh, there was a voltaic coil developed uh, that allowed uh, persons to uh, break down compounds into, quote, elements and then uh, identify them. Uh, and that led to the peri periodic table and uh, the setting forth of the elements as an investigation of the uh, primordial uh, um, structure of matter. And so uh, it seemed uh, to me that this little uh, history that I'm going to give you had some, um, it was an analogy to, to what I've somehow been doing to uh, investigate the uh, uh, properties of language uh, such that uh, you can get uh, into the inside of, of how words work. Uh, and uh, so, uh, let's see. The problem is that that investigation of, of matter uh, led to other discoveries uh, other elements such as radium, uh, um, Marie Curie, and plutonium. Uh, so um, I might um, have been better uh, uh, invited to participate in, in the, uh, what was it called, the annihilation marathon, uh, the uh, extinction. extinction marathon. <laughs> Let's not speak of such things. Uh, nonetheless, we face that, and everything we do nowadays is conditioned by the possibility that all of we just vanish, you know. So, um, and as you get older, that's uh, obvious. So, anyway. So, uh, I'll try to go back to uh, something I wanted to show. This uh, little poem of William Carlos Williams, very well known. Uh, so much depends upon a red wheel barrel. 
glazed with rain water beside the white chickens. Uh, this has been much discussed and, and considered uh, and as a, you know, a kind of imagist poem of, of uh, barnyard colors and barnyard stuff. Um, if you look at it closely, uh, it begins to break the words down, break into patterns, which can be variously heard and considered. Uh, so if you count it out by syllables, so much depends upon a red. It's four, two, three, two, three, two, four, two. And to me, of course, it's a question of how number relates to, to structure in, in verse and how it can be otherwise uh, regarded beside uh, the traditional Anglo-American uh, accentual syllabic prosody. I'm doing a, an, an impossibly quick, uh, but uh, so uh, a pawn is, is, is an I am. <laughs> uh, barrow is a trucky. <laughs> uh, so a red wheel barrow and then it becomes an insistent trochee, glazed with rain water beside the white. And at that point in that development, almost anything could be said. Almost anything could be said. Uh, but it turns out that chickens is said, chickens. So the poem conjures out of its own structure like um, some kind of, uh, uh, what, magical incantation, these chickens, which you can't really see in the barnyard at all. And chickens theoretically could have been something else. That was very important to me in my development, uh, to understand that by the time you got to that last line, the whole world was opened up, as William says, to the creative force of the imagination to recreate the world in the image of itself anew. And these powers exist in language in many different ways and, and were born into them so that in order to you know, solve the mind-body problem in the form <coughs> of language as a body that we're also living inside, you can attend to these structural elements of language um, and in different ways they, you become part of the process of the creation of the world that we know in the language that we use. But in Williams, the element here is the uh, speech line, uh, the musical phrase in Ezra Pound's term, yeah, how people speak to make the line graph the progress of speech. Everybody speaks differently. So if you hear how you speak, you can develop a, quote, voice by attending to the transformations of the way the language shapes itself in your speaking. I'm doing that now and exaggerating it. So that's one thing that I first heard. Um, after that, um, Williams himself, oh, I can press the button. Williams himself moved into something that he didn't use later, which was thinking that the element was not the musical phrase, but the word itself, the single word, no longer particularly related to speech but just thinking inside each word as each word gets said and, and the progress of what is said moves through each word. Among, of, a locust tree and flower. Among, of, green, stiff, old, bright, broken, branch, come. See, I'm learning how to gesture. 
white, sweet May. Again, this is just, you know, the spring branch blossoming. But you can track the event in the, the structure of language. If you think word to word, 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 word. And that is a possible way in which the uh, language can be brought, quote, closer to the condition of which it speaks. But also, if you just read it without thinking about him looking at anything and trying to chronicle it, it's the creation of this event of, of the branch blossoming in the words themselves. And this is a revision of, of an earlier poem with the same title, if you're interested in Williams, uh, that uh, Williams broke down into this form. So after thinking in the musical phrase, it was demonstrated to me that you could think word, 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 word. And that would be a way of, of engaging with the way something happens. Zulus Zukovsky is, is the master of this form. Zulus Zukovsky's A, starting A12, A13, A uh, with the one word uh, lines, and then moving into A22, A23, which some of you will know is written in five word lines. It becomes a way in which the world presents itself and appears. So the task, you know, generally speaking, is to discover how the language can be a part of the appearance. In and the best statement that I found of, of this, which is not in, quote, literary theory, literary criticism, but in, in Martin Heidegger's idea of how the poem can let be what shows itself. It's, it's, that idea is of no use to me as a writer, but it does provide a frame, a generalized, and evaluation of, of, of the work to be done. So I just throw that out there. So, uh, and uh, Louis, Louis Zukovsky's one word line was picked up by both Robert Creeley and Aram Sarayan, who is um, a participant in this marathon, uh, in his early, quote, minimal poems. Uh, in Creeley's book, Words, uh, oh. I don't know if you, I'll read these, you can't really see them. One was called A Piece, and it goes uh, one and one, two, three. And it's like, this is how things happen. Uh, as, quote, as easily as one, two, three. But if you think, for example, of the one word and the one word lines in, in Zukovsky and in that piece of Williams, you can actually live there, live in the formation of, of what is being said uh, if you look at things this closely. And of course, one and one is two, and the one and two is three. So you're thinking inside the numerical relations of the structure of the language as it's in unfolding, as you're participating in the, in the creation of it. And then uh, over on, the, it comments on itself, one thing done, the rest follows. That's in three, not from not, but in, in, not from uh, questioning what it is that you're doing, but, but from occupying it. And that creates a condition where you are, or it is, here, 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 here. And then uh, down at the bottom uh, from Creeley's uh, work, Numbers, uh, uh, collaboration with Robert Indiana, the artist. Uh, look at the light of this hour. And for me, the, well, morning or evening, it's the time in which the seven uh, is true and actual. Well, 
And then uh, after my engagement with words, I'm trying to wind this up, it's a problem for me, and where is the hook? The hook, time for the hook? My second apprenticeship was to the poet Larry Eigner, who was, uh, in part because of his palsied condition, he had to type with one finger on his manual typewriter. He was able to create words out of letters. So at this time in my development, I was struck by the fact of the letter itself coming to uh, create the condition of the world that, that it made. So all matter standing, build up, and there's a space in there, the space between the letters is part of the field of the poem in which the letters live. All matter standing, build up, wave to wave. A dark day, all this time, clouds, birds in the air, and it rains. Trees, a few leaves with stand, withstand the rain and are still there in the autumn. I guess what I'd better do is suddenly jump to what I have done to wind up here. Oh, there's another more extended concentrated presentation of, of my materials at Birkbeck College at the University of London on uh, Tuesday night at seven, between seven and nine p.m. if anybody's interested to come to that. Uh, this, uh, whatever it is, uh, for me there was a jump to drawing letters by hand, but still counting letters. And it just says rain, rain, ing, rain, rain, ing, rain, rain. So the sense that I have is that if you write those, I mean, if you look at that, why the letters are brought toward the experience of the condition of rain in the world. And so, and also if you look at the letters for their own sake and you're not listening to rain at the present moment that you're looking at them, they might create the possibility that someone could experience raining through the imagination by engaging with, with the text, what the text itself is. That would be my hope. I'm sorry, again, I, I knew I would do this, and so I myself, oh, I am being crooked off stage. <laughs> Time is out. And that's what's happening, I think, to, to, to possibly many of us. Uh, <laughs> to end.